We're in the midst of a huge transformation where our peers, communities, and workplaces are all really melding into one. Welcome to Reimagining Company Culture. My name is Christina Giordano, she, her, and hers, and I'm the Senior Partnerships Manager here at All Voices. Today, I am very excited to welcome our next guest onto the interview series, Keisha Payton. She is the Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at C-Space. Uh, Keisha, thank you so much for being here. If you want to share a little bit about yourself for our listeners, including your pronouns, and when you were younger, do you remember how exactly you answered the question of what do you want to be when you grow up? Well, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, again, I'm Keisha. I'm Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at C-Space. Um, I currently live in Atlanta. I've been working remotely for 11 years, long before uh, COVID. So I'm, I'm an OG uh, remote worker um, dealing with hybrid. Um, I'm a single mom. I have a 12-year-old son. Um, I personally identify as being a, a Black woman um, as well as neurodiverse. I have ADHD and my son has autism. So we have we have the range of things covered uh, in our in our house, um, which is part of part of my motivation in, in even doing this work and, and just making sure there's a space for everyone. Um, what did I want to be when I when I grew up? Uh, I you know I don't know that I had like the young young childhood like I want to be a fireman or something like that. Um, but in college, my goal was actually to be the first uh, female mayor of Atlanta, um, which we got one before we got yes. two now since then. Um, but it's funny because uh, you know getting a little bit more into politics, then I realized I want to be a politician. Like there's just so much to maneuver around. Um, and so that's actually part of what got me on a on a path to uh, to working in nonprofits uh, initially when I when I graduated. I love that. It's always interesting to hear kind of where you thought you would be or what your kind of goals or aspirations were. Definitely a, a leader now as well. And uh, I definitely want to ask, it's in the title of our interview series around this dynamic thing of, of company culture uh, with all of the changes happening in the workplace, conversations around the role of the employer in folks' lives. Mm -hmm. Positive company culture is something that a lot of folks are looking for in their careers, what they want to spend 40 plus hours a week uh, working on as well. Uh, from your perspective, do you think that the easiest way to improve company culture is to really remove or uncover workplace issues? Uh, why or why not? So oh, I think uncovering and removing those issues is important. What you'll often find, though, is that those issues are, are systemic and changing systems takes time. Um, so that can't be the only strategy. Otherwise, It'll, you'll take too long and make process, progress. You, um, you might get frustrated too that you're not seeing enough progress happen. So I think it's really twofold of kind of looking at what those issues and barriers are and correcting those, but also just you know changing the culture itself. Um, and a lot of that is just you know change management, kind of behavior. It's it's not, and it's going to vary you know company to company, um, you know in, in terms of where people are and how they. Um, you know, just just their their approach and perspective on DEI. Some some are more you know receptive than others. Um, but you you really have to help make it relevant for for everyone in the business, from um, you know the most junior people up to the most senior people, um, and encourage you know really encourage just seeing everybody for who they are. And and when you combine that kind of thing along with training, training is definitely um, helpful, um, particularly when it's not a check the box training and the you know the official kind of bias trainings and microaggression trainings are are definitely important, but but also just exposing people to you know to different ways of life and different backgrounds and perspectives. And when you can build that culture of appreciation around differences and then remove those barriers that's when you'll start to kind of really see change and, and kind of the pathway opens up a lot more. So you're not, um, you're not clearing, like clearing out the, the trees, you know, the whole time um, as you're trying to kind of make, make progress. Yeah, progress happens when you have a kind of multi-product approach and strategy, and you're really thinking about things from a holistic perspective as well, and you're able to be agile in how you you get things done as well, based on feedback and what's working, what's not, what needs to be further invested into. Uh, exactly. 
we know that different organizations, different industries uh, have different spheres of influence or impact when it comes to their diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. What is like the North Star key pillars of C-SPACE's diversity, equity, and inclusion um, initiatives right now? Yeah, so our, our North Star is to amplify the voice of everyone on every day in every space um, and make by making DEI core to what we do. Um, the way we came up with that North Star was really a lot of employee input. Um, so we'd had some, some co-creation sessions around DEI with our employees and we were able to capture all of that um, information and ideas. We do employee engagement surveys, we've had round tables, we have employee resource groups and we had our, um, our employee resource group leads uh, weigh in. Um, so we really like look to the whole business to come up with that mission, um, as well as just looking across you know, other, other businesses and, and kind of what they do. So for anyone out there who's coming up with their North Star, generally speaking, um, you know, there's three to four kind of components of the individual, like how are people experiencing? So that's where our every one platform comes in. And I'll say, since this is a, a video and so people aren't seeing it written out, it's actually written as every space one. And that's deliberate so that it's it's really a focus on every individual person, not just everyone collectively. And, and what's the lens that changes when you really bring that idea of like, how am I improving um, belonging and inclusivity for each individual, not just 80% of people feel, you know, included. What about the other 20%? Um, the second area is usually um, dealing with the business. And this is such a key piece because so many companies, um, you know, focus it solely on employees and HR and hiring and recruitment, but there's so many other aspects of the business that DEI should be involved in. You know, it should be influencing your company mission and values, your your approaches, your, um, you know, just how you do business, your products, your marketing, you know, it should be be embedded through all of that. And so that's our everyday pillar. And it's really about how do we bring, you know, this intention around DEI every day? Do we expect people to bring that every day in a perfect way and never get anything wrong? Absolutely not. They will get it wrong. But what we encourage is that you try, that you try to bring that lens every day and that you bring that in through, through all of your work and that it's not just contained in one kind of bubble off to the side. And the third pillar um, is usually an external one. So depending on your business, that can be with your customers or, or if you're B2B, it may be other, other businesses, um, but it, it's really looking out you know, externally. And I think of it as you know, if you're, if we've improved belonging for, for every individual, if they're showing up you know, every day with intention, then you can't help but wanna bring that into multiple spaces. And it's hard to just like flip that on and off. Um, so how are you impacting your community? How are you impacting um, you know, your, your customers? How are you, um, you know, changing your industry? Um, which ultimately even makes it easier if your industry changes, it becomes easier to make those changes internally as well. Um, so when you look across all of those three things, it, it goes back again to being holistic um, and how you can kind of make make that change, you know, across, you know, your entire, the entire kind of company. Yeah. And how are you meeting people where they are individually? How are you uh, checking in and really personalizing that experience? I like what you said about that statistic as well. I feel like we we see that sometimes in the market too around, you know, 80, 85 percent, 90 percent of employees are either satisfied or feel like they belong. But what about the other 10, 5 percent? That's really important to think about people's voices. And I want to ask too, when you talk about amplifying everyone's voice every day and every space can you give an example uh, for folks listening of you know what that looks like in practice yeah um and it's it's a lot of things right because you can imagine that if if that north star really crosses you know so many areas of the business that um you know it, it comes to life you know through different different pieces so for us you know it's a it's been a mix of kind of top in and top down bottom up um approaches so um, with uh, we have all of our uh, uh, directors and above going through leadership training, inclusive leadership training. Um, so really ensuring that our leadership is aware and equipped of how to make space for others, because you can't amplify voices if you have your leaders potentially shutting those voices down. So helping them understand the importance, the impact, and the the approach that they need to take, and some of the the behaviors they need to adopt in order to create these safe spaces across the business um, is one area. Um, another is you know when 
you look at kind of the bottom up, then it's it's providing spaces for employees to connect with each other, to feel comfortable, um, to be able to voice things. And then for that, the, the things they're voicing to then also make it to the top so that that leadership can do things about it in the event that they're they're having issues. So our employee resource groups are an example of that. Um, we we particularly flew in all of our black employees and um, we're headquartered in Boston. So we had a black in Boston event um, because we had had high turnover with our with our black employees and a lot of them were starting remotely and we just felt like they needed to build that community. Um, and so how can we how could we help create that platform for them to all come together um, and connect. Um, we also do uh, BIPOC biweeklies, which are sessions that spon sponsored by our um, BIPOC senior leaders employee resource group. Um, so all of our, our BIPOC directors and above are in a group and, and they all wanted to really give back to the, to the business and just show that representation and pathway. So we host um, biweekly roundtables for all the, all the BIPOC um, employees at the office um, just to give them the space to ask questions, to get to know senior leaders more, to help navigate their careers, um, you know, questions about work, questions about life, what, whatever comes up, you know, it, we, they, you know, it varies from, um, from meeting to meeting, but that's just intended to, to then be a space to really give them room to speak up and to get more confident and comfortable and know that they have people behind them. Since it can be tough sometimes when you feel like you're the only one to really to really speak up and kind of voice your opinion if it's different. Um, and so ultimately we want to make sure that we're kind of building that that space from all from all angles, you know, both from our, our more senior leaders um, to just brand brand new associate consultants that we have starting. Yeah, representation is something that is really important across the board, especially with leaders and creating a space and community and an opportunity for folks to connect with one another, bounce ideas, and really create a pathway for, for success too for others is also important. So I appreciate those examples as well. Uh, one of the other pieces that contributed to the your DEI strategy that I wanted to ask you about was the diversity, equity, and inclusion mindset map. Can you talk a little bit more about, about that and how you leverage that as well? Yes. Yeah, so we closed our business down for, um, for a day, both in 2020 and in 2021, um, for a DEI day. Um, and as a part of that, we had asked people um, in, in a survey, just how comfortable do you feel talking about race and ethnicity with your friends, with your family, um, with your coworkers? Um, and from that question, um, because we're, we're a market research company and do uh, consumer insights, so very much in our wheelhouse, but we were able to come up with um, essentially a segmentation tool that will tell you where you are in your DEI journey. Um, so it's, there's three segments, um, rejecting, reacting, and reforming. Um, and we like to use a bus analogy to uh, to describe them. Um, so if you're in the rejecting mindset, that's the equivalent of you're at a bus stop and the bus passes by. You're waiting on your bus, but you know that's not your bus, so you don't you don't need to pay any attention to that bus because it has nothing to do with you. It's going in a completely different direction. Um, in DEI context, these are people that maybe see DEI in the news. Um, but they're like, okay, I see this is an issue, but I, it's not relevant to me. It, I don't have to be, you know, connected or involved with this. Um, our reacting kind of mindset is, um, you know, imagine that you're on the bus, but you're just riding the bus. So you have no control over where the bus goes. If the bus makes a wrong turn, you're just stuck on the bus going the wrong way um, and you don't have influence over that. So, so when you have people in a reacting mindset, um, that means that they're they're really going to kind of go wherever the context is. So at C-Space, we talk about DEI all the time. So a lot of our employees feel feel more vocal and confident, um, you know, talking about it. But you might go home for the for the holidays and maybe your grandparents don't share your same perspective and you might be a little less likely to speak up. Um, so it's it's really in that context, you're just going to follow kind of the lead of others. Um, from a company perspective, that's actually not the worst thing ever, um, because it means you just need to give people guidance, um, but they're receptive to that guidance. And when you move into the reforming mindset, that's the equivalent of being the driver of the bus. Um, so you own the bus, you own the path, you know where you're going, you're directing, you know, you're directing where, where the bus is going. 
Um, and these are people that that have, you know, really, really accepted that DEI is a journey. So there's not a start and an end. There's not a finish. It's not about like listening to enough podcasts, reading enough books, and you'll be able to solve all the world's problems. Um, you also start to recognize at that stage that you will get things wrong. Um, so earlier in your DEI journey, as you, if somebody says you've offended them or you say the wrong thing, it can be kind of crushing. Like you, you take it very personally and it's like, wait, I'm not racist. And, and the reality is, is no, you may not be racist. You just said something that was, that was wrong. Um, when you're in that reforming mindset, you recognize that that's okay, that you, you own it, own up to it and learn from it. And then, you know, carry that lesson, lesson forward. Um, so for us, we've been able to use this mindset map um, to type all of our employees and understand where they are. Um, and then to create programming, um, you know, that can really speak um, to each of those stages. The, the biggest piece in moving people, um, particularly from rejecting to reacting, is empathy and them understanding relevance. Um, so for us, we tied that to people's, people's jobs. We're a market research company. We represent the voice of customers. If you're not representing all customers, then you're not doing your job. Um, so even for someone who, who felt DEI was completely irrelevant to their, their daily lives in the context of work, then they understood that in order to be good at their job and really do their job well, that they would need to be, you know, reflective of, of you know, multiple, multiple backgrounds and perspectives. Um, and so if you can really help people see just how it's, how it's relevant to them, then you're able to make, um, make more progress. We use this even, you know, as a framework with clients um, to see like where a client is and how ready they may be um, for different things we're proposing. Um, and so um, it's, and I, I even find it helpful kind of in one-on-one -on -one conversations where even just like randomly, not even at work, like I'll be at the airport and just strike up a conversation with a stranger. We get to talking and I can tell where they are in that map. And it sets my own, um, it sets my own expectations, I think, because as people are earlier in their journey, they'll get very defensive. Um, they can, you know, and really the reality is, is you're not going to change someone who's in that rejecting mindset to suddenly be in a reforming mindset. So if there's a lot of defensiveness, and even sometimes people will say statements that I, I find personally offensive, even, even that conversation is actually moving them along. So instead of walking away and feeling a little bit dejected or offended, um, having this framework in mind, I can, I can actually approach that as, you know what, it doesn't feel great for me personally, but this is actually progress. Um, and, it, and it really helps to just understand that everybody's taking baby steps. You are not going to move people leaps and bounds. You're going to move them step by step. So as you're, as you're doing programming, as you're creating training, just knowing that this is, this is a step-by-step -step process and your goal is just to move people that one step at a time and try not to give up or be frustrated or upset if you're not seeing people make that big leap and they don't understand or they just don't um, get it. Yeah, everybody as it is at a different stage of the process in their own individual journey, showing yourself and others grace when you can. Uh, and I also love a good analogy too. So I think that's helpful uh, in terms of a framework and understanding where you are too and asking yourselves questions when you're in uh, you know, these conversations. And I know kind of another piece of what you talked about earlier was around employee resource groups. As a former ERG leader, I love employee resource groups and think they're so important to building community uh, and company culture in general. I think the team created ERGs in 2020. Um, so I want to ask, how do you empower and really recognize employee resource group leaders? Yeah, so for us, um, we're a client services organization, so we work on billable time, um, which means uh, for those of you who are not in, in billable companies, that time is literally money. Um, so instead of we, you know, we had originally looked at could we free up some of their time, um, but but ended up deciding on giving them bonuses instead. Um, and I think what that did is really show just how much we value um, our ERGs. Our ERGs are a central part of our strategy. Um, they're, they're really kind of one of our main levers to pull for retention um, because we've seen in our employee engagement 
um, results that if you're a part of an ERG, um, then you're you're more likely to feel a sense of belonging um, and connected uh, to the um, to the company. So if we're placing that much focus on our ERGs and we and we inherently know the value that ERGs provide to our business, then we need to make sure we're valuing those leaders that we're asking to help kind of move the needle on on our DEI progress. Um, and so for us, a bonus. Um, a bonus felt like the right uh, the right way to to honor that value because so often we're just asking people to do this fully fully volunteer on their own time and fit it in um, you know which is necessary in lots of lots of our DEI work but you know how can we help um, just make people feel um, more valued for the contributions they're making for our business um, so in addition to that I think also just looking at our ERGs as a program versus kind of these individual groups, like how do we really create um, an employee resource group program that's beneficial for the leads as well? So they're giving their time um, and leadership to their groups, but how can we pour into them with training, opportunities, um, you know, places to connect? Um, each of our ERGs has um, an executive sponsor um, that's um, on our executive leadership team. So I'll all the, the chiefs and above are assigned to, to one of the ERGs. Um, they're deliberately assigned. So, so I'm not the sponsor for the Black ERG. We wanted to, we actually wanted to make sure that there was some, um, you know, a difference in the sponsor. Um, but, but I think that's also just a great way for them to have more, more time with senior leaders, develop different connections, see more of the business. So, so really, it's a matter of just how, how we're looking at ERGs as much more of a two-way street versus them, um, versus where in some companies you'll see them function kind of as, as volunteer clubs. And they're kind of off to the side and have to advocate. But we're really trying to um, you know, empower them and bring their voice into, into our strategy for our business. Mm -hmm. I think it definitely is a, a two-way street, a two-way mutual conversation and relationship in terms of, you know, it's a lot of time and important to have resources and executive support from leadership and recognition um, as well. And you mentioned kind of the role of the, the leaders in these groups too, in terms of having, you know, an executive sponsor. In, in general, how do you hold leaders across the company to be really accountable to themselves, to their team, to create Create more equity in their day-to-day -day processes, um, in their meetings, whether it's internal, external, too. Yeah, so we um, we implemented a new DEI competencies. Um, so at performance reviews and salary and merit um, increases, you know, people are required to meet a certain level of, of DEI competencies to progress in their career. Um, we debated a little bit, you know, in the beginning, um, because we felt like a lot of the DEI kind of inclusive principles should be a part of other areas of our competencies. So, for instance, we have a leadership area. So, so to be an effective leader, doesn't that mean you actually need to be an inclusive leader, right? So we debated on just kind of pulling, you know, building that in inclusivity throughout, you know, all of our existing competencies. Um, we ended up deciding to have just a separate, you know, a separate kind of category around DEI um, for a couple reasons. One being, um, one being the message that it sends, so that it's very clear to people that if you work at C Space, you are required to master this area in order to progress. Um, and I think that gets lost a bit when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, I've just lost my train of thought a little bit, but but I think that uh, that you know that that helps a lot in kind of progressing progressing people and making sure they understand the importance. Um, and then the other the other piece around around the competencies is that for where we are in this kind of day and age, you know, there's a tendency for people to want to weave everything in, and you want it embedded into into you know all of your your work, and that should be your end goal, and you should look to do that in lots of cases. But remember that we're not there where it's always a top of mind priority. So it's important to also call it out. So if you just have those kind of like more, um, you know, inclusive behaviors built in across the board and you haven't called that out specifically, um, it's very likely to get overlooked. Um, and so we felt like it was important to put that focus there. Um, so I'm excited about, about that because, you know, as I mentioned, you had, we had the people that we kind of brought along as DEI is the right thing to do. They were on board. We had our group of people we brought along around, you know, you need to understand um, that this is this is how we need you to do your job if you're going to be effective at your job. 
And then you have the people that maybe you're trailing behind and now you've tied dollars and career progression to it. Um, so that helps to, you know, hit again, if you think of the mindset map, you've got to hit people in different ways to be able to make progress. So what are those different level levers you'll pull to help match people's motivations? So um, it's a small, kind of a small thing, but, but really one of the things I'm most proud of from this year um, that we've rolled out. Yeah, and I think it goes back to that uh, kind of conversation around having a common framework for success. When you have diversity, equity, and inclusion competencies, you're using the same language. It's not a surprise that this is something that is expected from leaders to really think about and be tied to performance and what people are asking about as well across the, the business. Keisha, is there anything that I didn't specifically ask that you want to share with folks who are listening, or do you want to underscore any kind of key takeaways you hope people really bring with them? Yeah, I think um, kind of one of the main messages I've, I've just kind of focused on this year or, or just is the idea that we have to stop operating with a one size fits all mentality. Um, I think it's, in, you know, I, I when I talk to clients, I mention a lot that when you think of your customers, um, you know, or even when you think of your employees, like who are you picturing in your mind? And for years, a lot of people that picture is going to be kind of the, you know, what the norm is. So the um, you know, a uh, uh, cisgendered, straight, white male of privilege, um, you know, there's lots of different factors we can pull in there for what, you know, what that kind of model is. But how do you start thinking about everyone, you know, from all different backgrounds and all perspectives and, and recognizing that they're not all the same. And so your approaches aren't going to work, you know, for everyone. And in the past, I think those of us in marginalized and underrepresented groups didn't actually expect to be included. It's kind of sad, but that's a bit of my, my 2020 awakening that we expected that in order to have a voice, we had to, to, um, to assimilate to, to, to the majority. Um, but now I think that expectation's changing, particularly with Gen Z, where it's like, I, I'm a black woman with ADHD um, and, and I don't have to necessarily fit into the standard society. How are you providing me um, with the products or the marketing or, or my career um, that actually fits me and who I am as an individual? And this is, a, it's hard, it's changed. It takes you out of your comfort zone because it requires us to, to think differently and work differently than we have. But it's so, it's so important that we stop thinking of kind of the default and the norm and the neutral as as the majority. So I think that's my one my one big thing. Just remember, one size does not fit all. One size absolutely does not fit all. Uh, Keisha, thank you so much for being on Reimagining Company Culture this afternoon. I really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. And as a reminder for folks who are listening at All Voices, we really believe in both employees and employers being seen, heard, and understood. And know it's a requirement for the business to really succeed overall. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.